Please turn now in God's word to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, we've been going through portion by portion, and we covered in summary the end of chapter 5 way back, and then we went back and we looked at different different aspects of the Spirit's work within us, and we've been working through the fruit of the Spirit, those nine virtues, and So now we continue our journey into chapter 6 and beginning in the first verse. And just before we hear God's word, I'm going to pray. Oh God in heaven, we pray that as man cannot live but by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, that our souls would be nourished, that we would be helped and encouraged under your word, and shaped by it. O Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us illumination, that the word of God would be applied deeply so that it affects and changes our hearts, so that our minds and our attitudes would be turned to your will and that it would be done amongst us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Amen. So this evening we're going to talk about the church. Not the order and structure of the church but the church as the new community born of the Spirit of God. You see, Paul, having described the new life that we have in the Spirit, a life of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, now goes on to stress and to emphasize that this is not a life that is to be lived alone, but a life that is to be lived in a new community, constituted, empowered, and upheld by the Spirit of God. And I know that for many of us, we've had bad experiences in church. For those of you who've been around, you're guaranteed to have had bad experiences in church. But that's no reason to give up. And what I want us to see as we consider these verses is how good that new life that new community can be, and how it is that we as the people of God can aspire to be that new community in reality and in practice. And so what is the new community like? First point, first question. And the answer is, the new community is nothing like the world. It is absolutely nothing like the word. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, In Matthew 20 and verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. The rulers of the Gentiles, the world, the flesh, is one that rules through pride and coercion, through fear. Authority is exercised by the kind of people who enjoy having authority. And you see the the world's approach to community and to leadership as far back as Lamech, the seventh son from Adam, following the seed of the serpent. He was a very able man. He was a skilled man. He got things done, 
but he was a man of war, a man of aggression, and a man of vengeance. And these things are not to be so in the church and amongst the community of the faithful. Our Lord says, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And this is what Paul is communicating here. The characteristics of the new community. The new community considers itself as nothing. Verse 3 of our text, Galatians 6, 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You see, hubris and conceit destroy godly bonds of fellowship. When we think we are something, we erode all opportunities for friendship with one another. When we think that we are better than the other Christian next to us, or when we think that we don't need the other Christian next to us, we remove all of the reasons to have fellowship. And very quickly, the Christians around us detect that within us. But the new community knows that it is nothing. That if it thinks it is something, it deceives itself. Because the new community knows that everything it has comes from God. That without God's will, the new community would not have physical or spiritual life. Without God's will, the people that make up the new community would not have the means to sustain their lives and to contribute to the sustaining of the lives of others. The new community recognizes that it is an absolute dependence upon the God who has called it together, and that it is therefore an absolute dependence on the body that, it is, that God has called each member to be part of. And this recognition that we are nothing before God gives the new community an attitude of lowliness, of humility, of mutual vulnerability, and mutual dependence on one another. The new community exists for the benefit of all. The world is about self-preservation, self-care, and self-service. Not so in the new community, verse 2. In the new community, it bears one another's burdens, and in this it fulfills the law of Christ. The new community is not squabbling over the external laws of Moses, like circumcision and feasting and washing, but it gets on with the heart of the law. What does God require? Mercy and not sacrifice. Grace and love. Christ has commanded us to love one another as he has loved us. In this, the world will know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. And so in the new community, people aren't in it for themselves. They are in it for the benefit of one another and for the glory of God. It is a community that bears one another's burdens. In the new community, nobody is left alone to struggle. We all have burdens, and they're hard to bear. But in the new community, you have a body of men and women around you who will share with you in your trials. And to this end, the new community and every individual within the new community is diligent and scrupulous in regard to their own contribution. Verses four and five, let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. You see, the world looks over its shoulder. The world is concerned with what everybody else is doing or what everybody else is not doing. The world is concerned with the failings of others in order to justify its own failings, but not so in the new community. In the new community, the focus of the individual is on his own heart and his own righteousness before the Lord. He considers how his character has been shaped by the word of God, not by how others are failing. He considers how he is contributing to the needs of the body. He is conscious that he must bear his own load, that he must contribute to the care of the body, to the lifting of the burdens of the whole. 
The new community is outwardly generous, but inwardly demanding. And the new community is a community of grace. Verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you are also tempted. In the new community, those who have been liberated from sin despise the sin that put their savior to death, but they understand the struggle of sin. And so they sympathize with sinners and they earnestly strive to help one another in the battle against sin with understanding, with gentleness, with much grace. Who doesn't like the sound of this new community? A place where everybody is humble and lowly. Where everybody is there for you and for one another and not for themselves. A place where every member is diligent to contribute and where each member is touched by the grace of Christ. And so the grace of Christ flows out through their lives towards one another. This is an amazing community that Paul describes. And yet, of course, our sadness is that our experiences, as I've said, are nothing like this. The church is full of sin. The church fails all of the time. What is the church like? Second question. Well, the reality is that the church is far from the ideal that Paul presents here. And you know it. Uh, and for those of you who uh, have been around, even in recent history, you may have felt it keenly. There are deep imperfections in the church. There is a great deal of pride within the church. The body of Christians can be self-seeking and self-serving, all of the things that they're not supposed to be. And for the skeptic, they say, aha, the Christian religion is pointless. How many people have walked away from the faith because of the behavior of Christians? Loads. One of the number one reasons why people give up on the church is because of the behavior of Christians. Because they come to the church and they expect a community that is humble and loving and gracious. And instead they meet with the people who are prickly and judgmental and harsh. And don't care, don't truly care about others. And so the skeptic gives up on the church. But what I want you to see and to remember as we've been going through the book of Galatians is that in this same spirit-inspired book is the reality that the churches of Galatia are just as far from the ideal that Paul presents here as our experiences in the churches have been. There is biting and devouring in the churches of Galatia. There's disloyalty. Paul served with amazing self-sacrifice, and for a time the Galatians would almost have given him their own eyes if they could. But now that they suddenly have been uh, taken in by the new teachers, they've turned their back on Paul. A disloyal people. There's unchecked sin within the churches of Galatia. Shocking doctrinal error such that Paul comes out with some of his strongest words. If, if you or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. The hearts of the people of Galatia are cold and there are divisions within the body. There is a heavy dose of the world in this book. And the Spirit tells us that. The Spirit records those facts. So what do we do with that material? Should we be depressed and say, well, then let's give up on the church? No, what we see, if we would open our eyes with faith, is that the presence of sin and the failure of Christians does not undermine the truth, the reality, and the prospect of the new community that is described by Paul here. He still describes everything the church could be, even though he knows the church is nothing like that. And why is it that the church in Galatia and all of the churches that we have experienced fail so catastrophically? Well, the answer is because 
Well, there are two answers. One answer is that Christians are on a journey. Every one of you has been called and is being sanctified, but you are not yet what you will be when Christ returns. There is still a great deal of sin in each of your hearts. Sinful thoughts, sinful behaviors, and sinful habits, which means we will sin against each other. And so if we are to continue in the church, we'll only do it with a degree of patience and understanding, recognizing that Christians are on a journey. The other problem is that there will always be wheat amongst the tares. There will always be the wolves in a sheep's clothing. When you have been in some church in the past and you've been deeply hurt and left distrusting in the organization, you don't know. And maybe it was a wolf within the flock. It could have been. And what we need to do is trust the wisdom and the providence of God who has decreed that there would be such within his body, though we might not like it. And so there will always be sin within the church. And we have two options then. The first option is that we can go the way of the many. We can be offended. We can be disillusioned and we can give up on the church. But ultimately, to give up on the church is to give up on Jesus Christ. You cannot be a Christian but divorce yourself from the community of faith. So that's one option. The other option is this. That feeling the pain of everything that the church is not, but believing what it could be, We decide and we resolve that we will fight for this new community that is described by Paul. And so how do we do that? How do we fix the mess that we're in? And one answer is to say that we don't. We trust that God will. It is a community of faith. And we must believe that God is truly, powerfully, spiritually active amongst us. And that he will transform us and he will make us to be the community that he wants us to be. This is his work. And we ought to ask him and cry out to him for his help. Cry out for the fruit of the Spirit. You understand that if all of you were full of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control by the Spirit, the church would be beautiful. The church would be the very best place to be. And for every one of us, we would choose to be with the church rather than being with even our own families. If the church could only be filled with the spirit and his fruits be felt amongst us. And so in some sense, we can't fix the mess. God must fix it. And we cry out to him that he would. But in another sense, we can. And we ought to. As Paul describes here the new community in the spirit, we are to respond in faith. And then we are to do what I've been saying all the way through our series in the fruit of the spirit. We are to engage our spirit-renewed hearts in order to boldly pursue a reality that others deny. I've said this for many of you, but I say it again for Sarah's sake, that Uh, It's difficult sometimes to understand how it is that we say the fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit's work, and yet we are also to walk in the Spirit. And the way that I've explained that, and I believe this is right, is that when the Spirit comes into our life, the Spirit doesn't remove our mind or remove our heart and become a replacement for it, but rather the Spirit renews our minds and renews our hearts. And so what we're expected to do is to engage that renewed mind and that renewed heart, using that Spirit-renewed will to pursue the life that is described by Paul, that new life in the Spirit. And so we must engage and fight for the new community that we long for and that we don't recognize within the church. Number one, we must be forgiving. We need to remember how we have been forgiven every single day by God. Not just that point at which we turned to Christ when we were living in great darkness. We are to remember that now, having known God and having had access to his word, still every day we fail catastrophically. And yet, nevertheless, God never gives up on us. 
He is merciful and he is faithful. And he forgives us no matter how many times we fall down. We need to remember his grace towards us. And we need to remember the grace that others have shown to us. How many people do you think you've offended in your lifetime? More than you can probably number. More than you realize. But I bet there have been times that you have offended a brother or sister. And they've shown you grace. And they've forgiven you. And you didn't deserve it, but they did. Because they knew that God had forgiven them and so they forgave you. Think of how God has dealt with you. Think of how other brothers and sisters have dealt with you. And then so deal with one another. Understand that sin is never far from any one of you. Somebody offends you, somebody steps out of line. That could just as easily be you tomorrow. With that in mind, be gracious to each other. If anyone is overtaken in trespass, with a spirit of great sympathy, see that brother or sister weighed down. And in your healthy and spiritual condition, with great gentleness, restore that brother or sister. Assure them of pardon. Help them in their battle with sin. You see, the problem is sin will always be around. But if we allow it to disrupt our friendships, then we won't have any friendships. Sin will always be around. And so if we are to continue together, we must be forgiving towards one another. We must be a community of grace. We must never forget that we are nothing, number two. There is always the creeping tendency towards pride. We think that we're not proud, but ordinarily we are proud. We think that we're humble, and when we think that we're humble, we're not humble. And that self-sufficiency makes us hideous to others. What do you have that you have not received, says Paul? Nothing. All of your health, all of your intellect, all of your gifts, all of it has come freely from God. And any good that is in you every single day is the exercise of his bountiful grace towards you. You have nothing except that which has come from him. And so we must remember that we are those under grace in order that we might be graceful and humble to one another. Recognizing that we need God and because we need God, we need the church that he has ordained. And so we are in this together. Number three, we are to bear one another's burdens. Again, in verse 2, he says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, just this week, Stephen uh, lovingly shared with me the allegorical poem. Uh, you'll all be familiar with it, of the man who reaches heaven. And the Lord has an opportunity to say to the man, uh, let's look back over the course of your life. And he sees the, the footsteps, and there are two footsteps walking. And he says, who are these? And he says, that's me when I was walking with you and he's walking. And then he looks at the dark period of his life and there's only one pair of footsteps. He says, what happened at this point? And of course the answer is, well, they're the times that I, I lifted you up and I held you in my arms and the sentiment is beautiful and the sentiment is true, but it's not quite accurate. Because this is the reality, the real picture that for many of the saints who make it through this life and arrive at the gates of glory, when they look back on their lives, they'll see the two uh, pairs of footprints. But when they get to the difficult and the dark times, they won't see one pair. They'll see many, many feet around them. Because the way that God upholds his people, the way that God cares for his people is through you. You are the body of Christ. You are to be the mouth of Christ. You are to be the heart of Christ. 
You are to be the hands of Christ and the feet of Christ. So that when you look back on your life, you will see multitudes of feet. Because at your darkest and lowest points, the body of Christ has gathered around you to bear your burdens. The Lord Jesus Christ carries you, but he does it through one another. He has planted you here within his church in order that you might share the burdens of your brothers and sisters. And so knowing how God has been gracious to you, be gracious to one another, forgiving sin. Understand that you are nothing and have nothing apart from God. Bear one another's burdens. And then related to this, fourthly and finally, and this is a big one, stop caring what others do or don't do within the church. The big question is, are you carrying your load. That's what he says, let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Do you contribute to the care of the body? You see, the familiar pattern in almost all churches is that the bulk of the work is done by the few and not by the many. But we can change that. If every single one of you and whoever catches up online resolves to carry their own burden, to be um, that character that God has called them to be and to contribute practically to the care of the church and to the care of their brothers and sisters, if every member is doing this, then we will be cared for. If every one of you resolve to diligently and scrupulously examine your own contribution and then make that which is pleasing to the Lord, we will be that community where all are cared for. And so, yes, we've had terrible experiences in the church in the past and you know what? You'll continue to have terrible experiences. You can go to another church, you'll have bad experiences there. And you can stay in our church and you'll have bad experiences here. Because sin will always be around until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Nevertheless, in spite of that, the ideal and the model is held out to us. Of a new community that is not like the world. A community that is humble. A community that is gracious a community that exists for the benefit of the whole body, a community where every part does its share. And we have the choice to fight for that community. God will help you by the Spirit, but you must choose to do it. And so this is the new community born of the Spirit. Amen.